hypothetical um, application, you could say, so consider uh, we would like to measure electricity usage or energy usage by a client. And there are already some companies which are working on, um, on a product like this where um, you can generate a transaction, let's say every second, which measures how much electricity or energy a client is using. And this transaction is then recorded on a blockchain. And afterwards, the blockchain data could be analyzed for fine-grained tracking, fine-grained usage and billing, as well as if, let's say, some clients have uh, solar panels or other forms of renewable energies, and they are pumping um, uh, energy into the grid, that can also be tracked and measured to these transactions, and then they can get rebates for their, um, uh, uh, for their uh, electricity bills. Um, so we want to look at this example from performance and scalability point of view. Uh, so consider here at the bottom, if uh, we look at some articles published online about a year ago and uh, different companies which are trying to work on this as a test project. And the data we could gather uh, from there was if there is a single supplier and then a few major consumers or clients uh, uh, for that supplier, uh, we might look at about some 30,000 transactions being generated uh, per hour. Um, but if you want to take this small test project and scale it out uh, into some kind of, a, let's say, uh, a grid for a big city or a national grid for an entire country, we would be looking at um, uh, billions of transactions being generated uh, per hour. And of course, if the uh, systems uh, which are backing up and uh, which are being used to create uh, uh, these transactions cannot process these transactions uh, in real time, uh, then the whole idea of using uh, blockchain for fine-grained real tracking uh, goes away. So we did some more analysis on top of that. And what we figured out was if we take the current uh, blockchain systems, which are mostly software only, and we assume we can improve them by a magnitude of order, like by 10x, even then we would only be able to support about a thousand million transactions or one billion transactions per hour. So if you're looking at a national grid, that's far more more than what the current software systems with additional <coughs> improvement can achieve. And that's how we at Xilinx came to look at this uh, blockchain scalability and performance uh, issues area to see whether we can use hardware to accelerate and uh, go beyond the software only ball, which is the limitation of current systems. So keeping that example in mind, here on the left, I have some of the performance or scalability metrics. For example, I want to increase the transaction per second rate what's the benefit of that i can do better uh, find when tracking of the energy usage as well as i can support uh, more participants in the system but what does it mean to scale that out in terms of the infrastructure which is going to uh, and this kind of a blockchain system uh, in terms of compute we need faster execution of transactions uh, in terms of networking, because there are multiple nodes and peers in the system which uh, talk to each other, we need better networking, faster networking uh, to process uh, the transactions and move them around from uh, nodes to different nodes in the system. And likewise, in terms of storage, the storage will grow very fast, so we need you know, more and more storage, but also we need higher access rates uh, for that storage because we have many more transactions coming in on a per second. Uh, data on a per second time frame. So we need to do much more uh, accesses to the data lakes. So I'm not gonna go through all these, um, all these rows here, but the idea is that whichever way we try to slice it in terms of the performance and scalability metrics here on the left, um, our uh, understanding is that we need an integrated approach to network compute storage acceleration if we want to go beyond the software wall of the current blockchain systems. And I will uh, I'll go into some of more details of this in the future. Okay, now switching gears to um, what Xilinx is and what we do. Uh, some of the folks might know, but I get this question because 
primarily hyperledger projects were created from people who are mostly in the software domain. Um, so just a quick overview of Xilinx. So uh, Xilinx is the inventor of uh, uh, FPGA, which stands for Field Programmable Gate Arrays. You can think of this as a chip, a hardware chip, which can be programmed again and again. So just like you can upgrade a software after you have shipped uh, you know, one of your products, just like that, you can reprogram your hardware and fix some bugs in your hardware. So it gives you the flexibility that typically software systems have. And as of now, Xilinx produces different kind of uh, FPGA chips, uh, boards, and some development kits, as well as uh, it also provides acceleration libraries or software libraries, which kind of provide seamless integration to other software applications if they want to benefit from the hardware acceleration. And um, recently, Xilinx has also been producing acceleration cards, which are just like other, you can think of them as uh, you have a GPU card, which you can use for acceleration. Likewise, you can have an FPGA card, you can plug it into a server, and you can use it for acceleration of your applications. And uh, many cloud providers like Amazon Web Services uh, have these acceleration cards available uh, uh, in their servers, and you can rent them and use them if you want to. I'll skip the rest of the uh, info, which is just uh, some numbers, and then give you a bit of more uh, idea of what a programmable acceleration platform from Zop looks like. So here is a typical chip, uh, which has a few different type of components. The first one here on the left-hand side are called scalar engines. They are basically processors like uh, ARM processors where you can run your software applications. Uh, here on the right-hand side, you have some intelligent engines. These are basically specialized, custom-designed hardware accelerators. Uh, for example, uh, math engines for machine learning inference, uh, some signal processing engines for uh, signal processing applications. And then in the middle, um, here we have the adaptable hardware, which is basically the FPGA. So this is the part where uh, you can uh, uh, take your hardware design and uh, program it, and then you can change it over time as well if you want to. And then here at the bottom, there are some hardened IPs which uh, let you connect this, compute, this extensive type of compute engines to different type of other uh, uh, systems. Uh, for example, there is the PCIe IP here, there's DDR4 for memory connections, uh, there are Ethernet cores here, and so on. And these chips are now available as part of, um, as part of these acceleration cards. Uh, one of them is shown here called Alveo, which you can just buy off the shelf, and um, you can basically plug them into your server, and then you can use them for acceleration. So uh, before I go into the work which I want to demonstrate today, just want to give you a bit of background of our group. Um, we started looking at uh, blockchain about uh, one and a half to two years ago. Um, initially, we started with the, uh, public blockchains. So those of the, those who don't know, uh, blockchains are either public or private slash permissioned. In public blockchains, uh, the very famous example is Bitcoin. Uh, and then in private, there are a lot of different options, but Hyperledger Fabric from IBM, which started from IBM, is one of the uh, uh, most uh, popular one. So uh, with um, public blockchain, um, there's a company called Bitmain, and that's uh, one of the largest providers of uh, mining tools um, in the world. And we collaborated with them. They had a system which is shown here on the right-hand side. So this is a tool from Bitmain, and then they would use a proxy which would take a job from this pool. The job basically represents creation of a new block on the blockchain. And the faster a pool can create a new block, um, uh, it has a higher chance of adding it onto the blockchain. Uh, that's how these uh, um, uh, Bitcoin and public blockchains are designed. Uh, so it's very important that you are able to uh, take this job or this new block which the pool is proposing and be able to distribute it to the end miners which are going to do the actual work. Uh, so latency, networking latency matters a lot. 
So we work with them on accelerating this part of the system where we took their strata mining proxy and uh, implemented it on an FPGA um, uh, system using the Zinc chip from Xilinx. And uh, we were able to show uh, many orders of magnitude of improvement in latency. And they were able to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they were able to test it in their own production system. And then we published it at the Crypto Valley Conference. Um, then we moved on to the private blockchains. We looked at Hyperledger. We started um, with profiling and benchmarking Hyperledger fabric. And we came to figure out that there are a lot of areas where software is not very uh, fast at the moment. There are a lot of bottlenecks, which are very suitable for hardware acceleration, especially FPGAs. So that's how we got started in Hyperledger Fabric. And uh, initially, we proposed some software-only database access optimizations, and we published that work uh, at IEEE Mascots last year. So now I'm going to talk more about what we have been doing in the last six to nine months. Um, and this is where we bring in uh, full hardware acceleration into Hyperledger Fab. A bit of background about Fabric uh, before I go into what we did. Um, Fabric consists of a network of different nodes. And these nodes um, execute so each node is like a server which is executing some part of a software application. And here uh, the nodes are represented at the top. So we have clients which basically uh, generate transactions. Uh, we have uh, endorsing peers which uh, basically take the transactions and process them. There's something called ordering service which would create blocks and then there are some other nodes which are non-endorsing, which only take blocks and process those. So a typical flow of how a transaction flows through a Fabric blockchain network is that a client would generate a transaction, send it to a number of endorsing peers, and wait for the endorsements from those peers. These peers would tell whether this transaction is valid and so on. And once the client has enough endorsements, it would send that transaction back to the ordering service. The ordering service would get a lot of transactions from different clients and will put them, order them into a block. And once a block is created, that block is sent out to all the peers, irrespective of whether they are endorsing peers or non-endorsing peers. And these peers would take the whole block, validate um, all the transactions in the block, and then finally commit that block to the ledger or add it to the blockchain. So that is kind of the generic flow of how transaction uh, goes through a fabric network. And in many other uh, permissioned or private blockchains, the flow is more or less the same with you know, minor, uh, mod like minor changes here and there. Uh, that's kind of the idea of permissioned networks. So there is no proof of work kind of algorithms which are typically used in Bitcoin or proof of stake algorithms that are typically used in public blockchain systems. Okay, so um, let me come to why we did blockchain machine. Um, so when we started looking at Fabric and um, we did a lot of performance benchmarking on Fabric and looked at a lot of previous uh, work which was done on it, which is um, I mentioned here at the bottom, one of our papers is also here. We figured out that validation phase is one of the major bottlenecks uh, uh, for the Fabric uh, uh, blockchain. And the primary reason for that could be broken down into um, three parts here. There is a lot of cryptographic operations which are done because each transaction has some kind of a signature which needs to be validated. Some transactions have multiple signatures. The block has a signature. So there are a lot of cryptographic operations which are done during the validation. Uh, the second is that a lot of block and transaction data involves unmarshalling of protocol buffers. The protocol buffer is, uh, uh, is a serialization and a deserialization protocol from Google where you can take some data and then serialize it and send it out to any other machine which can understand protocol buffers and, they can, and the other machine can then, or the other application can then deserialize it. So that involved, uh, that took a lot of compute um, uh, in the validation phase. And finally, the state database accesses were typically slow and were one of the major bottlenecks. 
so we looked at this and we figured out that this is something which we can actually uh, uh, actually offload or accelerate to the use of hardware accelerators on FPGAs. So we started with the goal of building uh, hardware accelerators which are FPGA based for hyperledger fabric and we wanted to improve certain performance metrics like transaction throughput or block uh, and we implemented uh, the validation on the peer, uh, which is slightly different from an endorsing peer in that it only uh, performs the validation phase. It does not do any endorsement of transactions. And our blockchain machine was implemented on a network attached um, accelerator card from Xilinx called LU, which I showed earlier. And at the hardware level, we did two things to kind of affiliate the bottlenecks which I mentioned in the last slide that we try to read the block and transaction data directly from the hardware interface coming into the FPGA. So there is no need for this data to go all the way to the CPU and get processed in the software and then get sent back to the, uh, to the FPGA for processing. So we bypass all that and instead we uh, uh, introduced uh, our own custom protocol and we were able to retrieve this data directly from the um, interface of the FPGA card. And then we implemented a very efficient integrated block level transaction level pipeline in the FPGA to do the validation of transactions blocks in a parallel pipeline manner uh, uh, so that we can achieve significant improvement in transaction throughput. And as of now, we integrated this uh, blockchain machine with uh, Hyperledger Fabrics version 1.4.5, and we are working on upgrading that to one of the more recent versions of Fabric. So the current status is uh, we have a proof of concept uh, where we have a server with a standard network interface card and a Xilinx LVO-based network interface card. We generate the blockchain machine hardware using a predefined uh, number of transaction validators. So you can think of this as uh, the number of transaction validators is uh, configurable in our system. So based on the application you want to run or multiple applications you want to run, you can have four transaction validators or eight and, and you can uh, have better throughput. And likewise, uh, um, the hardware is generated using a predefined set of chain codes. So chain code is basically um, the code which is part of the transaction, which is executed during the, uh, during the endorsement phase, and then it's checked back again during the validation phase. Uh, so if you have multiple applications, they can have different chain codes or different business logic which they're implementing through chain codes. Um, and finally, we integrated this whole setup with Hyperledger Caliper, which is another project from Hyperledger. It's a benchmarking tool. This is a standard way of benchmarking different Hyperledger projects. So we integrated our work with that so that we can benchmark it. And um, in all the experiments, all the testing we have done so far, we saw at least an order of magnitude improvement, 10x improvement in the transaction commit throughput when we compare it to a software validation only peer. So let me go into a bit of more details of the demo. Um, okay. So as I mentioned, the demo is run using Hyperledger Caliper. Um, the Caliper uh, sets up the Hyperledger fabric network, uh, which involves bringing up different peers, bringing up the orderer, and it also brings up our blockchain. So we modified uh, Caliper with some of our own internal uh, with some of our own uh, improvements and we have written some other uh, scripts and automation tools around Caliper to enable all this. And for this particular demo, we ran small bank benchmark. This is an application which mimics, uh, which mimics banking uh, application, banking operations. For example, I can create an account, I can transfer uh, some dollars from account A to account B uh, and so on. And then in the Fabric network, uh, the way we organized it uh, is that we use two organizations. You can think of this as um, two banks, for example, ANZ and Commonwealth Bank. Uh, and each of these uh, organizations has two peers uh, and a single separate ordering service for which is ordering blocks for these two organizations. 
in each uh, of the organizations, the first peer is an endorsing peer, so it can accept transactions, it can endorse those transactions, as well as it can validate blocks later after the blocks are sent from the ordering service. The other peer was only a non-endorsing peer. It does not do any endorsement of the transactions, but only validates the whole block. So this is uh, how we do the apple to apple comparison. So we look at this non-endorsing software only peer and then compare it with our blockchain machine. Um, the endorsement policy here, two of two, basically means that for every transaction to be valid in the system, uh, it has to have an endorsement from organization one, which is bank A, and organization two, which is bank two. And finally, we added the blockchain machine as the third non-endorsing peer to organization one. And in our setup, the ordering service would send the blocks to the lead peer in each organization, as well as it will send those blocks to the blockchain machine. Um, okay, there are a few questions. I'll get to them after the demo. Uh, yeah. Okay, moving on to the demo setup. Uh, for the blockchain machine, we used Xilinx LVOU 250 board. It's available off the shelf. Anybody can get that block, can get that board, and uh, and then can use it with our solution. Um, and uh, getting into a little bit of more details for Caliper, this is not really that uh, needed here, but just wanted to give an idea that we created six different uh, virtual machines on multiple servers. And one of the machine, one of the VM is acting as an auditor, and then four of them are acting as uh, the four peers in the two organizations. And then we have a client VM, which is uh, creating transactions at an aggregated rate of about 500 transactions per second and sending those to the peers as well as the auditor. And we had a separate server, which is set up as the blockchain machine, as I mentioned earlier. And we configured that uh, blockchain machine with eight transaction validators. You can think of this as it's kind of equivalent to what I mentioned here as the eight VSCC threads. So these threads are basically eight parallel threads which are used by the software to validate transactions. So we use a similar number of transaction validators in our hardware as well. Okay, uh, this is just a video of the demo, but I'm going to switch my developer mode now and uh, I'll show you a live demo of the work we have done. Okay, so this is one of the servers we have where I have set up a few different VMs and from one of the virtual machines, I'm going to run our custom script, which uh, basically would run all the, <coughs> sorry. Okay, I cannot, my screen is a bit messed up. Um, sorry about that. reduce the font size a bit. I increased it to make sure that everybody can see it easily, but now I cannot see what I'm typing here. So uh, I'm going to go back to the original one and at least start something first. Okay. So what's happening here is it's creating a few different identities for the different peers and orders um, uh, inside the uh, fabric network and it's trying to bring up that network. Thanks. Thank you. Not sure I'm gonna get to it. <laughs> so people who are familiar Please. with fabric <laughs> and high no, caliper uh, would I'm be able it. to uh, kind of, uh, I don't really understand see what some of these about. commands as being heavily used it's in Black Friday again. Yeah, no. oh, then uh, yep. fabric internally uh, depends on uh, okay. dockers so dockers are containers oh, which okay. you can bring up uh, it's like lightweight containers which you can bring up in in different servers uh, to run different uh, uh, parts of the application 
So once um, that part is done, um, we will run the hardware here. Okay. It's kind of getting a little bit harder for me to read, so I'm gonna go back to the smaller thing. This is how I started the hardware peer. Okay, so now I'm switching back to the other command line where I was running the benchmark from within a virtual machine. So you can see a lot of transactions being sent and some of these transactions have errors. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is deliberate because the benchmark is designed in a way that it would create both uh, good and bad transactions, uh, and uh, so that you can test a system that works fine in case of both the good and the bad. And it would send about ten thousand transactions uh, to these peers at five hundred transactions per second. Uh, rate. And here you could see that the benchmark has finished sending transactions and it's going to gather some logs from these um, uh, v virtual machines and then we're going to analyze those uh, logs to look at the uh, to look at the performance metrics so this will take a few seconds uh, some of the logs are a little big So now it's shutting down those containers and the VMs um, because the benchmark is almost done. We're gonna switch back to our hardware peer and we're going to shut that down. So the benchmark ran successfully. It will put some numbers here and there in different files. So I'm not going to show those numbers here, but switch back to my presentation where I have um, put them into a small graph. So it's easy to do. Um, so uh, coming to the acceleration results, uh, one of the things which first I want to point out is that uh, these are only for the validation phase. So again, remember that we implemented the non-endorsing or validation only peer uh, in our blockchain machine as of now. And when measuring the uh, commit throughput, uh, the total validation phase also has another operation at the end where it would actually commit the block to the ledger or the blockchain, which is basically writing that into the file system. So that part can be done asynchronously. So uh, that part is excluded here. Uh, when doing performance measurements because it's asynchronous and it does not affect the performance. Uh, so the commit throughput here, uh, the first graph is um, plotting the block latency in milliseconds for the entire block. And the second graph here is the commit throughput, which is in thousands. So you can see this peer one of organization one, which is a software only peer, was able to achieve about 2,700 2700 transactions per second. The blockchain machine, which is peer two in organization one, was able to achieve about 46,000 transactions per second. So this is about uh, 15 x speed up. And if you're wondering why some of the block latencies here are a bit lower than these block latencies, so these two peers here on the left hand side, uh, these are the endorsing peers. So recall they do both endorsement of transactions as well as validation of the entire block. But these three peers here are 
the non-endorsing peers, they do not endorse any transactions and they only validate the incoming block. So that's why their latencies are slightly smaller than the endorsing peers. Okay, so uh, with that, I am going to sum up my talk and give you a bit of um, uh, a high level overview of what our vision of this blockchain machine project is. Um, so consider that we have accelerator cards available from Xilinx or any other FPGA vendor. So those cards are plugged into servers and they form the lowest uh, layer here for the, for the hardware accelerator cards. And then here at the top, we have different blockchain projects under Hyperledger umbrella. There is Hyperledger Fabric, which we used, but there are also other projects like Hyperledger Desu, which are which is Ethereum based, and so on. And we would like to work on these layers in the middle. And what our goal here is that we would like to provide a very basic hardware shell, which implements the core functionalities of a blockchain machine, and then on top of that, we can have programmability in the form of different uh, chain codes uh, you can install, or you know, different accelerators you want to use uh, in inside that blockchain machine. And then these get plugged into the uh, with the help of some uh, API adapters into the standard software um, uh, uh, projects, and then. For these three layers, what it actually means to work on is that we can look at the transaction flow in a very generic way that transaction is created and then it gets executed uh, and then validated and gets formed into a block and then the block gets validated and added onto the uh, ledger or the blockchain. And each of these steps involve one or more of either compute, storage, or networking. So for example, the demo which I just uh, demonstrated falls under this step four here where multiple transactions are uh, created, uh, are already part of a block and that block needs to be validated and added onto the blockchain. And this operation is very compute and storage intensive. Um, and then we accelerated this part. But in future, we're gonna of course look into these other uh, operations or the other parts of the system through which the transaction has to flow and then look at acceleration opportunities there. With that, we have a few, you could say, short-term future work goals and a few medium term long-term. So short-term is we are already working on migrating this to Fabric version uh, 2.2. Um, the reason is 2.2 uh, is the is the most recent long-term support version from Hyperledger Fabric, and uh, uh, many people are already transitioning to Fabric 2.x. So we are already working on migrating our blockchain machine to Fabric 2.2. Um, then uh, in the near term, uh, we are also looking at something called Hyperledger Maps. This is another area under the Hyperledger Consortium where uh, people can share their uh, work, which is non-production ready, which is more in the research phase, which is not ready yet for you know, widespread adoption. So we are already working on a proposal and we would, in, in the coming months, uh, uh, contributing our work into one of the Hyperledger Labs projects so the community can then become successful. And then in the medium term and long term, we definitely want to look at other blockchain systems. As I mentioned, Hyperledger Desu, which is based on Ethereum uh, without proof of work, or Hyperledger Sawtooth, which is based on um, uh, Intel's uh, SDX technology. So we would like to look at these other blockchain systems, profile them, understand them better, and see that there are any uh, acceleration opportunities in those blockchain platforms as well. And then finally, last but not least, um, we are always looking for collaboration opportunities with other companies and, uh, and other researchers from uh, universities. So if you have any ideas or if you think there is something which we can work on together, please feel free to reach out to me after uh, the discussion. With that, I will stop here and uh, I would love to have your questions. Oh, thanks, Dr. Harris. Uh, any questions? Uh, I saw some questions in the chat box. So uh, probably, uh, Dr. Harris, you can address them at the beginning. Okay, sure. Uh, let me... Um, so... Okay, 
there's a common path to capital sounds like uh, tokenization model and it's also good to see how Apple is trying to build a no token based model. Uh, Amar, would you like to elaborate a bit on your question or suggestion? Thank you, David, for the nice presentation. Uh, uh, my question, when I saw the, the model that you uh, brought at the beginning about the uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, there is a billing system and the monetization of this, I thought, okay, this is can be tokenized. Uh, so why would we, like, how can it be in a hyperledger, uh, put in a hyperledger, uh, infrastructure so that just was a question uh, popping into my mind but uh, I understand now it's just an example for that you were showing at the beginning but it's probably what uh, we will be talking about uh, okay, my, my right. question actually that yeah my question actually is about a predefined uh, chain uh, chain code uh, that you um, so you have the accelerator hardware uh, you say that you can uh, pre-program it with the chain code, right? Okay, so if in a case like, uh, I, I have a business case, like I'm building a, a blockchain network where the, uh, there, is, uh, there is the participants in the network who can create the chain code uh, or the smart, co smart contract uh, uh, logic uh, like on daily basis like it's not like uh, like I, I can say so what I want to say is uh, it's not like a one click uh, business logic that will run every time uh, it's actually going to change uh, daily so predefined chain code here is like uh, deployed once and uh, installed on the network or it can uh, on the runtime I can change the, the, the chain code on the on that accelerated uh, on the on the acceleration hardware. Right. Uh, so that's a very good question, um, and it's one of the areas we are currently working on. Um, so um, yes. So what you're referring to is that you have a chain code and then you upgrade it. So you started with working one chain code, then after a few days or second day you wanted to change the business logic so you just like in fabric you can install version 2.0 for your chain code um, so as of today uh, we if you want to upgrade your chain code yes you can do it but you have to regenerate the whole hardware and then you have to reprogram the, the accelerator part and then uh, you bring it online again in the system and, and that's how it will work but that is not a very uh, very good and flexible solution, so we understand that, and we are working on a better solution for that, where you would be able to kind of um, just like in Hyperledger Fabric, you can write a small um, a chain code program in GoLang or any other lang, and uh, you know you can call it. So we are looking at creating some kind of a small, I wouldn't say microprocessor, but you know a, a smart contract engine, and then you can basically write the new business logic on top of that, or maybe you already have it in one of your own high-level languages like Golang, and then we can just compile that into the uh, machine code or the assembly language for that um, smart code or smart uh, contract engine which we are working on at the moment. So that's work under progress, but the demo which I showed at this point, we have to regenerate the hardware. Did I answer your question, or you have any any other follow up? Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, that's that, that answered my question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So there is another question from uh, um, Sidra. Um, you mentioned the performance improvement by 10x. Did you also analyze the use of multiple LGO boards? If single board was used, did number of validator nodes have any? Uh, any impact. Um, so as of 
now we haven't looked at al multiple alveo boards so our setup is that a single alveo board is like a single ear or a single node but inside that single node just like on the hyperledger fabric software stack you can have uh, multiple threads to uh, to basically run the VSCC, which is the validation system change code, and based on policy uh, uh, evaluation, uh, you can have multiple threads to do that, which can process these transactions in parallel. So within this single peer node and a single algebra board, we have just like that multiple validators. And of course, if we use more validators, we can get uh, better performance. Uh, if we use less number of validator nodes, we get uh, less performance. Okay. Um. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hi, please. Yeah, yeah. I got a question. Uh, I'm not working on blockchain. Um, the question is about the performance goal. Where's that uh, speed up uh, from? Uh, it's from uh, parallelism um, because uh, intuitively, the, the speed up should be higher if uh, there is a massive um, uh, instruction level parallel. It seems uh, the interaction between uh, FTJ and the database, uh, the hard, uh, the hard disk, may take a significant amount of time. Uh, okay, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, let me clarify a little bit more about the architecture. So the architecture was deliberately left out of the talk because it's uh, company work. So we are going to, uh, of course, you know, patent it, of course. But yeah, we are also going to make it uh, open source in the future, as I said, in the Hyperledger Linux project. But I can give a little bit of more detail about, um, about that. Um, so at this point, we do not have any interaction with the hard disk. The database is all in memory. Uh, so it's an all memory database right on the FTJ card itself. Uh, yes, it is still, of course, one of the bottlenecks even in our system, but still it's much, much, much better and uh, uh, faster than uh, the CPU uh, using the database uh, uh, from its memory as well as hard disk. So, you know, there are some, uh, there is a very famous paper uh, called Fast Fabric where they just used, um, where they just uh, assumed that the whole database is residing inside the memory of the CPU. So, and in that case, they were able to show that they can scale Fabric to about 20,000 transactions per second. But in our case, since we can even further optimize that, even at the clock cycle level, uh, because the, I know how many uh, uh, cycles it would take to read or write into my database, which is all on the FTJ. So I can even do a bit of better optimization here. So that's we have a bit of uh, we have a better improvement uh, from that. The second improvement comes from the fact so in this validation phase, yes, database accesses are slow, but still the major bottleneck is the uh, cryptographic operation. The verifying signatures takes a long. And on the CPU side, if let's say you're using Intel, Silver, Xeon, or like uh, uh, the, the Xeon Gold, they have a few number of uh, hard-wired blocks in their CPUs, which can do some of the cryptographic operations. But of course, you cannot scale that, right? On top of that, it's multi-threading. So in our case, it's, uh, it's basically the hardware is generated by us. It's configurable, mm -hmm. so I can tune it much better. And I can program it according to whichever application I am looking at on top of it. So that's the other part where we gain much more improvement because we do both parallel and pipeline uh, evaluation of the signatures. And that's where most of the improvement comes from and then the database accesses. Thank you. Okay, there are some other questions on the chat. So, um, we asked, can you explain a bit about smart contract engine? Um, so that's uh, something which is uh, under progress. So we don't have a full implementation of that yet, but 
Uh, well, I know three Jews. So <laughs> I'm from the same university. So uh, what I would say is you can think of it as, let's say, um, microcoded engine, or let's say as an ALEM processor, but that you know, only does um, uh, um, execution of smart contracts. And then, of course, we could, uh, uh, because smart contracts, they can have, um, uh, like based on which language you are going to support, et cetera, the, uh, the type of operations which are supported cannot be any arbitrary operation, so we can kind of optimize it there. Uh, it's still work under progress in the sense that we are looking at different design options, and we have done some bit of experimentation out there, but uh, uh, it's still in early stages for us. Okay, um, there is another question on the chat. How is the mapping of the VMs into the Xilinx boards? Uh, I think he has answered yeah. this question actually. So uh, let me elaborate on the question uh, really. So with our, uh, with our own experiments, uh, so we've been doing experiments with Caliper uh, with our own chain codes and also the, the, the sample chain. Uh, what we placed is that uh, the network latency can really can really distribute these uh, kind of components of the fabric is is massive. So uh, now, so we've tried uh, running the whole thing on a single laptop, uh, running them across uh, the same cloud provider, different cloud providers, hybrid scenarios, and you see there like the the the, the, the latency is, is massive. So my question here is that, so first of all, so these six VMs that you mentioned, uh, uh, where are they located? As in, if they are kind of all, everything is happening on your board, or is there any other machine that's uh, that's involved? I, I, I would like to know a little bit more about that. Thanks. Great question. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The, the moment you try to go uh, let's say uh, you take your VMs and you want to deploy them across a wide area network. Yeah, the, the latency of the network comes into play, and uh, you would probably see that your bottlenecks start shifting towards maybe the ordering service or the client sending in transactions, etc. Uh, but in this particular case, because we were um, focused on uh, looking at the validation phase, so we try to avoid those in case where the network latency would be a problem because otherwise the, the performance uh, benchmarking we are doing would be diluted or would not be uh, representative of the actual system. So our VMs were uh, located in our own private, I wouldn't say cloud, but uh, we have a small setup of a few different servers which are connected to a local area network. Um, and our Xilinx board, uh, our boards are also connected to the same local area network. So we did all these experiments on a local area network with VMs in different servers. And uh, for us, uh, as you would know that in that setting, network latency is not relevant. Okay, thanks, thanks. Hi. Uh, any other questions from audience? Dr. Harris. Hi, Harry. Can I just ask you a quick question? Um, uh, yes, you, have, you have this thing. Can you go back to the slide that you have with all the layers, if you don't mind? Uh, this one? Yes, please. So you've got the block check that, uh, uh, that uh, of course, I'll be a board there. The block check machine cell you've already built, is that right? Uh, yes. And what about the others? What levels have you built so far? Uh, so we have I see that everybody are hoping that everybody else is going to do this work. Right, right. Yeah. So, so that's yeah, that's actually the whole idea here. So even for the blockchain machine cell, we have implemented most of the core functionality to let's say maybe for hyperledger fabric. But let's say in future we. Um, look at Hyperledger, Beisu, or some other uh, blockchain platform and figure out, oh, there's something else which could also be a core component and has to be in the machine shell, so that would go there too. 
but then with the, uh, with the other two layers, yeah, we only picked those things which were needed by Fabric and only implemented that because this demo was specifically for Fabric. And now we are looking into some of the other things. But there, what we did was, for example, um, if you're working with Fabric, so you know, start to that. That when you get a transaction, you have to validate the transaction. And you validate the transaction based on some kind of a policy. So if you remember, I mentioned something about two of two, and there's a policy that if this transaction has an endorsement from bank A and bank B, then it's a valid transaction and should be added to the ledger. So that's one of the um, uh, uh, plugins we would add there that I'm implementing a two of two endorsement policy, which would mean that, okay, I have a small either hardware circuit there or maybe a small microcredit engine there, which would look at the signatures on this particular transaction and then see whether it satisfies this Boolean policy or not. So that's one of the examples that would go into the configurability with system accelerator plugins. So that's an example of that. The second is, uh, let's say, the database itself. Uh, uh, so for our case, we built a very small database, which is a key register, uh, because Fabric uses a, a go level DB as one of its default databases, which is basically a key register. But since this is hardware, we restricted it to a certain size of like these kind of entries. So if you are looking at some other application or some other blocks platform, that would be different, or you might need a very different database design, so that would go in there. And then with the second layer, which is like programmability with user chain code. So user chain code is like the smart contract, the business logic design. And for our case, uh, that was small bank. But then again, if let's say you're doing Ethereum, Ethereum has its own Ethereum virtual machine, which could also be implemented on hardware, and then you will uh, and then you write your program in a very high level, high level language like Solidity, and you compile it into Ethereum virtual machine uh, 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 instructions, and then you run that here. So that's the part where the user chain code would be. So as of now, most of the things we did and we built were uh, specific to the fabric, but now, yeah, of course, we're at a point where we're going to get other blockchains, or yeah, if the community wants to contribute to it, we are more than happy to you know, work with other people who can uh, you know, uh, spend time on this or who want to explore this uh, platform further. Because we have limited resources, we, we are going with a very uh, specific agenda to at least showcase a basic system and show that you know, there is potential here for hardware acceleration and you know, project permitting blockchain systems. So can I just follow up that with another question? Could you, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm a little bit, I, I don't know enough about this. Out why you accelerate in this way, how, how you accelerate it. So, if I put 10 normal machines, would it, it have the same speed up effect? Um, if you talk about um, just the, uh, so, so let's talk about fabric because this is built around fabric. So, let's talk about that first, not like the generic any blockchain platform. So, if we just talk about fabric, um, let me actually go back a little bit. Okay, so if you just talk about fabric and this validation phase here, uh, each uh, each peer, which is like a single machine, uh, but it could be a multi-core machine, right? So you put 24 cores there, or you put 48 cores there, uh, has to run this whole thing sequentially one by one. So what we did was, first thing is, we tried to see where you can and then uh, this could be pipeline. If, let's say you know some transactions are here, then I could have some more other transactions working in this phase, something like that. So etc. Um, now, if you put a single machine with 48 hours, uh, the current fabric software would only paralyze this part. Uh, sorry, this part, the VSCC system here, which does this signature verification. But again, it only uh, paralyzes it across transactions, not overlapping. So uh, putting like uh, 10 machines doesn't make sense here because this whole sequence has to be done in a single machine uh, and has to be done sequentially. Yes, you can put 10 of them, but we, we know that you will be moving data around, the communication latency will come into play, so most probably whatever benefits you're going to get, uh, you will lose them. And the second part, 
this is again has to be sequential or unless you do some you know a smart pipeline of this whole but there are some other parts where you can put more machines and then the hardware resolution doesn't make sense for example this endorsement here uh, there has been one paper recently as well and we also believe in the same thing that we, we started with both endorsement and validation for acceleration uh, candidates but then we looked at endorsement. So what happens in an endorsement is that you send a transaction to, uh, to a peer. Uh, it will execute that transaction, which internally means that it would be uh, executing the smart contract or the chain code, uh, which is part of that transaction. And then sending a result back to the client saying, yes, I endorse your transaction, it's valid. Uh, now, if in a system where I want to go from 100 transactions per second to uh, 300 per second, I can put three machines each handling 100 transactions per second, but I would get an aggregated rate of endorsements which is about 300 transactions per second. But that does not happen in the validation phase because irrespective of whether you are endorsing or not endorsing, this part has to be done by every peer in the system and has to be added to each replica of the blockchain. And that's why here putting more machines or scaling it out using multiple machines doesn't make sense. Uh, but in endorsement, it does make sense, and uh, we personally believe, and I, I personally believe that endorsement is not a very good candidate for hardware acceleration. Okay, thank you. That was a nice talk. That was good. Thank you, Lakish. So thanks. Cool. All good. Um, so we are close to, you know, uh, ending of this um, meetup. So uh, any last question from the audience to the doctor? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, this is Joel from Snap. Um, so, um, so after you get um, 10 times speed up, what is the performance problem now that is going to uh, Sorry, can you repeat it again? After getting 10x speed up? Yeah. So, in your current state of the art solution, uh, 10 times speed up. Um, and uh, after that, what is the problem now? Okay, uh, so if you look at soft, so we don't know of any architecture being um, uh, worked on at the fabric as of today, um, but there are some software optimization in the past year, so the best numbers we have seen so far is about 20,000 transactions per second uh, mm -hmm. from uh, um, state of the art, so if you compare that it's 46,000 which we have with uh, minimal hardware, so that's still obviously better than what we have seen in the software. Um, of course, in future, we might be doing some more optimization. This is just the starting of uh, building the interfaces and so on. Um, and uh, in terms of the second question, what are the other bottlenecks? Um, so uh, I believe that once we put the validation phase uh, significantly like what we have now for then um, if you test the system with uh, just sending 20, 30,000 transactions per second, um, I think the ordering service will like um, one of the other um, participants asked the question uh, that network latency becomes a kind of issue. So the, the more workload you try to put on the system, uh, the ordering service will be getting so many transactions, have to process it, have to send those bigger I think the network latency will be uh, a big bottleneck uh, in the main service part. Uh, if we are able to significantly improve the performance of the validation. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, all good, everyone. Thanks, um, Dr. Harris, for your brilliant um, content and uh, insightful answers. So, um, Thanks everyone for uh, you know uh, joining this uh, meetup. I uh, appreciate your time. Have a, a nice day, nice evening. We'll see you next time. Yep, thank Bye. you everyone for coming to the talk. Okay. Thank, thank you, Harris. Thanks, Harris. Bye. 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 Bye.
Thanks, Harris.